Well, we've all heard the old story about Jesus and Moses out playing golf. And they got out on the golf course, and on the first tee, Jesus looked at Moses and said, Arnold Palmer makes this par five and a par four. And Moses said, okay. <laughs> and they played the hole, and they went on to the next one, and Jesus looked at Moses and said, this is a par five, and Arnold Palmer can do it in three shots. And Moses kind of rolled his eyes and said, okay. And he kept going, they played on and played on, and finally they got to about the eighth hole, and Jesus teed, teed off, and the ball went right into the water. And so he just kind of makes a huff, and he pulls up his gown a little bit and just walks across the water and reaches down and gets the ball and starts walking back. And someone was standing there with Moses and said, my gosh, who does he think he is? Jesus Christ? And Moses said, no, he thinks he's Arnold Palmer. <laughs> yeah. He thinks he's Arnold Palmer. Yeah. You know, all of us have people in our lives that we want to you know, journey with and we want to become more like and, and we think if only we could be that way that we could uh, would be better in somehow than what we are right now. The scripture today talks about the passage where Jesus and the disciples at that point go to Simon Peter's house and it says his mother-in-law is very ill. Now, it's interesting that they said she was very ill because usually they would say she was possessed with a demon or that she had an evil spirit within her or something like that. And in this passage, it just says she's ill, she's sick. And so Jesus goes in and finds this woman probably with a terribly high fever, is on the verge of death, and Jesus goes in and it's a beautiful thing that happens here. Jesus just reaches out and takes her by the hand and pulls her up. And in that raising up, she is healed. She is healed. Jesus, in that one act, lifts Peter's mother-in-law out of brokenness into wholeness. And in that moment, her first response is to go and serve. Now there's lots of problems with this if we judge it by our modern standards. First of all, you notice that she doesn't even have a name. She's just Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And secondly, Simon Peter's wife isn't even mentioned. I don't know if she had left him by that time or why, you know. Maybe she ran off with John the Baptist, I don't know. <laughs> She'll find out sooner or later he loses his head and she has to leave. But anyway, we don't know why she's there and not named. But we do know that in Peter's household that she has the role of being in charge of hospitality. She has that specific role of being the one in charge of the meals, the guests and making sure that everything runs smoothly when it comes to serving other people. And so she immediately jumps up and, and does that when it's her, when she's healed and when she is, has been given the opportunity to be healed again. And that is what an important message from the scripture is all about. And I'm not going to go as far as to say that each one of us has a specific plan and a specific purpose in life. There are those who would say that. But I know that in our lives as followers of Christ, we have the opportunities to use our gifts and our talents to the best of our abilities. And usually the only thing that gets in the way of keeping us from doing those things and serving, as we talked about earlier, is that in some way we become broken. Some way we become broken. Now brokenness can happen in a lot of different ways. We can literally fall down and break a leg. 
we can easily fall down and injure ourselves where it changes the way we think. We can get sick, full of disease, and it keeps us from getting out of bed and doing the things that we are called to do. All of those are brokenness. And all of those are the things that Jesus came to heal and to pull us up from. And in pulling us up, Jesus creates a wonderful intimacy that calls us together as the people of God. Because when we reach out and touch someone else in service and in health, we are creating community. We are creating a community that calls us together to use the gift, the gifts we have in order to build up the community. The church is made up of all of you. And all of you bring different gifts and talents to the church. And God calls us together because of the gifts and talents that we have, I believe. It was my experience when I was a pastor at First Christian Church in Claremore, Oklahoma, many moons ago, that we had a gross spurt not too long after I got there. And we had 40 new members that started coming to church within the year. But in that first two or three months, we had um, an insurance person, an insurance adjuster, a banker, and um, one more, an architect, all joined our church. And I thought, well, this is cool, you know, people with minds and are achievers and go out and do things. And then within the month, the church burned to the ground. Kids broke in and robbed some things and then tried to destroy their, the evidence by setting the choir robes on fire and, and burning the whole church uh, sanctuary down. And it was obvious to me in the months that followed why these specific people had been led to our church. Because as soon as you burn down a building and you have no building in which to worship, you need a banker, an architect, an insurance appraiser, and an insurance adjuster, you know, all these people. And they jumped in. And they jumped in and then we rebuilt the church and we got it going uh, soundly, you know, financially soundly. And I couldn't have been more impressed with God more impressed with a God who saw what was coming, perhaps, and brought the people we were going to need. But we had the gifts that God had given to these people and all the other people in the church that came together after that incident and were true community because it pulled us together. And that's why we, what happens in the church when the people of the church are willing to uh, encourage the gifts of each other and welcome those gifts and be community together. When one is sick, willing to reach out a hand and lift up, lift them up to wholeness and to uh, health once again, just like Carly said, if they're sick, you should help them. And that's what it mean, takes to be, to be community and to be church. There are lots of different kinds of people. Lots of different kinds of people in this world. And God calls each of them to bring their gifts and their talents and their spirits to church. So that the church can be what it needs to be in the world. For once was a, there is a story of once there was a, an old rabbi who lived out in the woods. And he was a well-known rabbi for giving advice and being wise and courageous. And this small church on the other edge of the, of the woods was 
was slowly dying. And the membership was going down, 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 until there was only like three or four of them left. And so the pastor of the congregation decided to make the trip through the woods and see if this rabbi really was as wise as everyone had said he was. And if he could give ideas on how to change the direction the church was going. And so he walked out all morning to get to where the rabbi lived in the woods. And the rabbi was standing in the doorway waiting for him. And he said, come in, please, and let us share some tea together. And so they shared tea, and they talked, and they talked all afternoon. And then finally, as it was time for the pastor to start back to town, he told the rabbi about his situation with the church. And he said, Rabbi, can you give me any advice on what to do? And the rabbi looked at the pastor and said, well, I really have no wisdom on church attendance and growing a church, but I can tell you this. The Holy One is in your midst. And so the pastor got up and thanked him and came back and said, what kind of advice is that? The Holy One is in our midst. And he went back and he told the four people that were left. The rabbi says the Holy One is in our midst, but he has no idea how to make the church grow. And so they all thought, well, that was a wasted trip, and they went home. And then one by one, they began to think, maybe he's right. Maybe one of us is the Holy One. I wonder who it is. I wonder if it's me. And as each one began to think these same thoughts, each one began to treat the other as if they were the Holy One. And they began to give love and attention and help and prayer and praise for everything the others did. And it became such a close, loving community that other people in the community would come and they'd visit and they'd hear and they'd experience this, this welcome and this love and they would come back. And then another one would come and experience what it is like to be treated as if you are the Holy One. Or how you are treated if the other people think they might be the Holy One. What is your responsibility if you are the Holy One? How should you treat one another if one of them might be the Holy One. I think it would look a lot like this passage of Scripture where Jesus walked in to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house, found her sick and in bed, and gently and kindly and warmly reached down, took her by the hand, and brought her out of that broken condition into the wholeness of life that Jesus has in store. Because see, Jesus knew who the Holy One was and what the Holy One was supposed to do. And then he called to his disciples and said, Come follow me. 